And uh, right now, I'd like to turn you over to Larry Reed. Thank you very much. Thank you. I may work my way up to that podium in a little bit, but f at first, for first, uh, or to start out rather, bleh, you can hardly spit that out. I have something on the overhead that I want to share with you. Uh, as all of you know, we are about to engage in a great national debate over government in health care, and there will be a plan put forth by the Clinton administration uh, probably this fall that will likely involve uh, proposals for considerable expansion of government influence and domination over health care. So we're, we're going to be engaging in a great debate here uh, fairly soon, which means I think to be prepared for that debate we ought to understand some uh, health care terms as uh, the government might define these health care terms. So that's what I've got here for you. In fact, I've entitled this Dr. Fed's Glossary of Health Terms. Can you all see that all right in the back? I'll just run down the list here. Uh, you all know what an artery is, but under the new definition in government health care, that will become the study of paintings. <laughs> Bacteria will mean the back door of a cafeteria. <laughs> You've all, all heard of barium. That's what a doc doctors do when a patient dies. <laughs> Uh, bowel, the new definition is a letter like A E I O R U. <laughs> Caesarean section, that's a neighborhood in Rome. <laughs> Cat scan, that means searching for kitty. <laughs> Maybe I could have put socks there, searching for socks. Cauterize, that means to make eye contact with her. Get it? Caught her eyes. <laughs> Colic, that's a sheepdog. <laughs> DNC, that's where Washington is. <laughs> Dilate, means to live long. <laughs> An enema is not a friend. <laughs> that has a double meaning, doesn't it? <laughs> Fester means quicker. Fester, fester. <laughs> uh, genital is not a Jew. <laughs> a GI series is a soldier ball game. <laughs> Hangnail, that's a coat hook. Impotent means distinguished or well known. <laughs> Impotent. <laughs> Labor pain means getting hurt at work. <laughs> Oops, I don't want you to see these too early here. Medical staff, that's a doctor's cane. <laughs> Morbid, a higher offer. Morbid, get it? <laughs> Nitrates, cheaper than day rates. <laughs> Oops, sorry. That's one page. A few more here. Node, that means was aware of. <laughs> you, you knowed something. Outpatient, here's one of my favorites. An outpatient, it's a person who fainted. <laughs> Pelvis, cousin to Elvis. <laughs> Postoperative, that's a letter carrier. <laughs> Recovery room is a place to do upholstery. Oh, here's a great one. Rectum means dang near killed him. <laughs> Seizure, that's a Roman emperor. Tablet, that's a small table. Terminal illness, means getting sick at the airport. <laughs> Tumor, that's more than one, and two more. Two. Urine, Opposite of you're out. You're in, you're out. Right? <laughs> and varicose, that means nearby. <laughs> Very close. Vain means conceited. <laughs> Better get used to those terms. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, with that as a preface, we will try to solve America's health care crisis. <laughs> I'm going to come at this as, uh, first of all, as an economist who, when it comes to health care policy, is still somewhat of a novice, a lay person. And if all I can do this morning is to get you thinking in a certain context, to raise certain questions that may not be raised uh, in the forthcoming national debate, then maybe I can put you ahead of, uh, of millions of Americans who uh, will not know what to ask and not know how to analyze forthcoming proposals. So as I thought about America's health care crisis, and that's the way it's often sold, we, that's a phrase that has become almost hackneyed because it's used so often. We have a health care crisis. I ask myself, well, what is the crisis? What is the nature of the crisis? What's the problem? And I thought, well, could it be poor, deteriorating quality? How many here would argue that that's what's happening to American health care? That that's the crisis, that the quality of care in America is poor or getting poor or poorer. It's deteriorating. Yeah, I see a few nods, but, uh, and, and I, can, I can see, I bet you're thinking of certain particular instances which in most cases I can trace to some other bad policies that are producing that as an effect. But by and large, when compared to the rest of the world, would you say that our health care is deteriorating or that other countries are surpassing us, that people are leaving America to get treatment in other countries? No, it's quite the opposite, isn't it? As a matter of fact, when it comes to new drugs and new technologies and medical advancements, in spite of many regulations that are preventing some of these from happening, we still lead the world, don't we? People are still coming here. In fact, I've given you an article that talks about Canada a little bit from an interesting perspective. We're often told that the Canadian system of free and universal care, national health insurance, is something that we ought to emulate. Well, that little handout plus the book that uh, Winston held up, this one, 20 Myths About National Health Insurance, will explain why that is not the case. In fact, the article I gave you points out that the Premier of Quebec, Mr. Barassa, where did he go for his recent major operation? Not to his own nation's free and universal system. He came to the United States. I think that speaks volumes about their system. We still lead the world in, in many uh, medical areas. In fact, when it comes to the Nobel Prize in medicine, consistently, year after year, it's almost always won by an American. So I don't think that if there is a health care crisis that it is poor quality or deteriorating quality, except in a few isolated cases that may have its, their own percu peculiar explanations. Well, what about uh, unavailability? Or, or declining access. Is that part of the crisis? Are there more and more or large numbers of Americans who need care and aren't getting it? Well, maybe, but do you think, is, has that reached crisis proportions? Do you hear of people who need surgery but are being denied that surgery in America? Is that, uh, are those instances commonplace or becoming ever more common? I don't sense that that's the case, and I suppose if I had spent some time digging up some numbers. I could have documented that for you. So I'm really appealing to kind of a gut feeling here. I don't sense that that's the crisis in America. In fact, 88% of American hospitals are organized as nonprofit institutions. 12% are for-profit. And all of them accept a good number of charitable cases. Many, most doctors do that. I believe it's illegal, in fact, for a nonprofit hospital to deny someone needed care. So I don't think that that's the problem. I don't think that there are... When was the last time you heard of long lines of people in America? You hear about this in Canada and Great Britain where they've socialized medicine. But have you heard about uh, eight-month waiting lists in America to get a gallbladder operation? No, it's just unheard of. And I suspect that it's, that's an intolerable condition that most Americans, if confronted with, would not stand for. But it is commonplace in much of the rest of the world. So I don't think that it's unavailability yet either. I don't think we have waiting lists and long lines and people needing surgery and being denied it. Maybe there's some things we can do to improve access, but I don't think that any problem in that area today is a crisis. Well, what about cost? The cost of health care. There we could probably make a pretty good case that something's going on, something needs attention. There I would say, yes, I think there is, if not a crisis, some, a problem to some degree or another. It's, and it's probably becoming more acute. I could buy that, and I 
judged by from, from some of the uh, nods in the audiences that most of you would uh, recognize that as a problem too. Whether, whether or not you'd call it a crisis uh, is maybe a subject for, uh, for debate. But it is true that uh, health care costs have been rising at about twice the general rate of price inflation as measured by the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. So some people may look at those numbers and say, well, that indicates something's wrong. There's where the problem is. The cost is getting out of hand. It's rising at about double the rate of, of general price inflation, which then should lead us to ask some questions. So as you can see, I'm just sort of strolling through this step by step to determine what is the crisis, what's caused it, and what might we do to address that. Why has this emerged as a problem, health care costs. What makes health care costs rise? Well, I've got three or four things here I want to throw out to you as, as suggestions. What makes health care costs rise? The first point I'll give you is uh, something that affects everybody and everything, and that is general price inflation. If health care costs are rising about twice that of the consumer price index, then by definition you could say that about half of health care costs increases are attributable to general price inflation. About half. Well, of course, we could get into a discussion of money and credit and the Federal Reserve and talk about where all that comes from, but I think you've, you sense that that's an economy-wide problem and it stems from the fact that there is a single monopolist when it comes to the production of money and he's not doing a very good job at that. That's called the federal government with its deficits and its paper money and its um, federal reserve system. So there's one contributing factor that accounts for perhaps half of the increase in health care costs. Well, what about declining supply? That does cause prices, all other things being equal, to rise for any commodity. If its supply is declining for some reason, and all other things remain equal, that tends to push price up. Is that a factor in health care costs rising? Well, uh, I see some say yes, some say no. I'm going to argue later when I talk about some of the uh, problems in healthcare that that is a factor in certain specific areas where there have been restrictions placed upon supply. That's a cardinal rule of economics. Anytime supply is restricted, supply declines for whatever reason, all other things being equal, that tends to put upward pressure on price. So I think that yes, that's a factor, and I'll give you reasons why a little later. What's another reason why prices or costs can rise? How about rising demand? Rising demand, all other things being equal, can push uh, prices or costs, after all costs are somebody's prices, they're the same thing in a sense, that can push uh, prices up. Let's examine health care. Have we had features or characteristics in the health care economy that have led to rising demand? I think so. I'll give you several examples. One is the desire for more and better health care. The desire for more and better health care that springs from our ever-rising incomes. You hear people complain when they talk about this health care crisis. They say, isn't it a shame that in Canada they spend less of their GNP on health care than in America? And the fact that we spend more suggests automatically, it's prima facie, facie evidence that uh, we are spending too much. But keep in mind that as nations become wealthier, as people become wealthier, they do tend to spend a higher portion of their incomes on health care. How much do you, think, do you think per capita they spend on health care, or as a portion of their income do they spend on health care in Uganda? They don't have time to think about that. Right? They're too busy scraping by just for many people there for bare subsistence. As a people become wealthier, we shouldn't be surprised that they decide they can afford and want to spend more for uh, the avoidance of pain and for longer lives and for better health. Okay, so I think we've had rising demand in part because we've had rising incomes as a people. And we seem to want to spend more to, because we have more to take care of our health. That's a factor. Another one would be uh, an another reason why demand is, has been rising is that because of tax and other policies I'll get into in a moment, many times in the healthcare economy you have people spending other people's money. There's an awful lot of that, isn't there, in the healthcare economy? Third-party payments. In fact, you know that now nearly half of all the dollars 
the health care dollars that are spent in America are spent by government, whether it be Medicaid, Medicare, or other health-related programs. Half of all the, almost half, it's like 48, 47 percent, of all health care dollars spent in America are spent by governments, federal, state, or local. Well, by definition, even if you are a fan of all of those programs, by definition, it's that, that's somebody spending somebody else's money. And another cardinal rule of human action and of economics is, as Milton Friedman has put it, nobody spends somebody else's money as carefully as he spends his own. Nobody spends somebody else's money as carefully as he spends his own. I guarantee you that as frugal as I might be, if you give me your money, I will spend it differently than I spend my own. I will buy things that I wouldn't buy if I had to pay for, for them with my own money. And I think that's probably true for every one of you here. It's human nature. I don't see how that's possibly avoidable. It's a fact of life. And there's an enormous amount of this going on in the healthcare economy for various reasons. And it is contributing uh, to this rising demand which is assisting in the uh, increase in healthcare costs. Another factor that explains rising demand in healthcare would be social and demographic changes or developments. Social and demographic changes, such as the aging of the population. I'll give you some numbers here. The aging of the population. In 1960, 9.2% of Americans were aged 65 or over. 1960, there were 9.2% of Americans aged 65 or over, 9.2 percent. What is it, or what was it in 1987, the year, most recent year for which I have figures? 12.2 percent. Why is that important? Because as a rule, the elderly tend to pay more uh, or buy more health care. The aging of our population is a factor in rising demand. Also in America, another feature in explaining rising health care demand is that we spend much more to help the elderly or to help premature babies, people that in many other countries would simply fall through the cracks. We spend enormous amounts of money, and I'm not saying that that's bad, I'm just observing it. That's a subject for perhaps another discussion. But we spend enormous amounts of money on premature babies and, and the elderly, the extension of life, sometimes with little regard for the quality of life. But that is a factor that it helps explain rising demand for health care. Another factor that explains the rising demand, the last one I'll give you before I move on, uh, would be regulations and mandates. Regulations and mandates. I don't want to get into these at the moment because I have them organized in another chunk of this talk. But for now, I think I just simply want to identify the fact that there are growing numbers of regulations coming from all levels of government, mandates coming from all levels of government that have contributed mightily to the increase in demand or the increase in cost uh, for health care. Okay, moving along, having said all that and identified cost as, you know, if there is a health care crisis, it's probably primarily, if not exclusively, a cost phenomenon. Now I want to raise this question. It seems to me that if we want to solve this problem, there are basically, maybe this is oversimplification, but I don't think so. I think there are essentially two paradigms that we can consider embracing. Two paradigms, two systems, two directions that we can go in to address our health care crisis. One is to follow or, or, or try to develop market solutions, try to generate uh, market solutions to health care problems keep the market in charge or, or enhance its ability to resolve these health care problems. Or we can go the government route. And there's a range of ideas that have been thrown out on the table under that heading, from national health insurance, which preserves some elements of the private sector, all the way to socialized medicine, in which case your doctor becomes a government employee, as they have in Great Britain. The market or the government, of course, you might say, well, isn't there a third paradigm, some mixture of the two? I suppose you could say so. But I don't think that's a new paradigm. It's just a combination of one of the, uh, of the other two. A very, usually a very unstable combination. In fact, in market after market, if you decide, well, let's have a mix. Let's have a little bit of socialism and a little bit of free enterprise. 
invariably that seems to put us on a path toward ever more socialism because each intervention by government that tends to cause problems becomes an excuse for the next intervention. So I would argue that there really are two paradigms and an unstable third perhaps that is nothing more than some combination of the first two, the market or a government. Let's take a look at government in healthcare. Again, we're going to be debating this as a nation. Not only the high school debate teams in the fall, but the entire country is going to be addressing how much government do we want in health care. And there will be proposals in Washington to give us enormous expansions of government. In fact, as the Clinton plan is taking shape, it seems to be revolving around a managed competition plan. I'll get into that in more detail. And what is the criticism coming from a huge chunk of the Democratic Party already, led by Pete Stark of California? They're claiming that this is a betrayal, that in fact what they want is something like Canada or even Great Britain has. They want government to go whole hog and, and be in the driver's seat when it comes to health care. As we consider this question about, you know, do we want a massive expansion of government in health care, we should be asking these kinds of questions. What evidence do we have that would suggest it would be wise to trust health care to the government. Now don't laugh. You might be tempted to think I'm government bashing here, but no, I'm raising a legitimate question. I think we ought to be asking this. What evidence do we have? After all, this is a crucial aspect of our lives. This is life or death here that we're talking about. We shouldn't be deciding just willy-nilly without giving it a lot of thought to turn it over to government. We should be asking what evidence do we have to suggest that it would be wise to turn more chunks of our health care, therefore our lives, over to government. The kinds of questions that come to my mind would be this. Well, is government an expert in cost control? <laughs> do, do you think that's unreasonable to ask? I mean, that's why we're getting into this big debate, because everybody's saying cost is the problem. We need cost control. All right, is government an expert in cost control? Not the last I heard. I'll let you answer these, by the way. I'm, not, I'm just rhetorically raising these questions, but I think they should be asked. Uh, does it manage its budget well? <laughs> Before we ask it to manage the national health budget or your personal health budget or any hospital's health budget, we ought to ask, does it manage its budgets well? <coughs> How about this? Is government in the forefront of generating medical advancements? Is government in the forefront of generating medical advancements, medical achievements? When you think of great discoveries and achievements in medicine, do you think of bureaucracies or do you think of free people? The government sector or the private sector? Oh, here's a great question to ask. Does it have a lot of time and money on its hands? <laughs> Because this is going to be a costly endeavor. They're already talking about the potential of massive tax increases to fund this new national plan. We should be asking, as taxpayers, not just as people who are interested in solving the health care problem in this country, does government have a lot of time and a lot of money on its hands? Another question. Could politicians be trusted to manage health care altruistically? and not politicize the system, altruistically. In other words, for the benefit of the nation, selfishly. Can we trust them to manage and direct health care or set up bureaucracies that will do it this way, that will do so altruistically? In other words, thinking of you. Another question we ought to ask would be, uh, has government proven itself with its existing health care programs? Do we have reason to believe that, well, what they have done in health care has worked well enough that we can trust to them much greater chunks of this, of this uh, aspect of our lives? You know, the Detroit News uh, recently, just a month or two ago, had a front page lead story headline that read, Medicare to go bust by the year 2000. Medicaid, do you know any doctors or hospitals, health care providers who are happy with the Medicaid program? If you ever talk to them, what will they tell you? They'll tell you that the, the paperwork burden is monstrous. They'll tell you furthermore that the government consistently welches on its obligations. 
that they don't reimburse at market rates, that they cheat the doctors, they cheat the hospitals, which ends up in cost shifting so that instead of Medicaid, Medicare paying for the costs of Medicaid, Medicare, those costs are shifted to people who have private insurance. So I'm suggesting to you that there's enormous room for improvement in the way the government manages its existing health care programs. It seems to me that before you want to uh, empower them to, to uh, do so much more in health care, we ought to say, hey, clean up your act. How about this question? This is one that's hardly raised anymore on any proposed expansion of government. Does the Constitution direct the government to get into the health care business? Now, there are lots of folks out there who would say, oh, ha, ha, right wing, you know. This, is, this guy's living in uh, the Dark Ages 200 years ago, agricultural society. He's raising questions about that old document called the Constitution. We want to get the job done. What do we care about what the Constitution says? As Ron Paul, I think I mentioned this to you yesterday, you'll probably hear him later in the week make, make this argument, when he used to raise the question of, is it in the Constitution? Can we do this? When program after program came up, you know, he was laughed at. Congressman thought, well, you know, what difference does that make? Why should that be a consideration? If we want to do it, let's do it. But you know, maybe we haven't made this point strongly enough so far at this seminar, but the whole purpose of a constitution is to have a rule book, right? A book of rules. Can you imagine playing a game like Monopoly in which we tear up the rule book and just say, hey, anybody can do whatever they want? It'd be utter chaos. So we ought to be asking, does the Constitution grant the government to, uh, the, the power or the duty to, to get into the health care business? Oh, here's a great one, too. I love this question. Does it run the post office well? <laughs> really, I think this is a relevant question because before we ask government to start managing CAT scans and technologies that are beyond its comprehension, we ought to ask, has it figured out after 200 years of experience how to deliver the mail reliably and at a reasonable cost. Have postage costs stayed even with the general price index? Hey, there's a measure of government cost control, right? They run the show. You see what I'm getting at? Why on earth would anybody say, hey, we have a health care problem, the government is the solution? When it comes to the post office, I remember Johnny Carson one time saying, there are, uh, describing the three classes of mail, he said that first class is when you hang on to the letter you're going to send until the person you were going to mail it to comes to your house for a visit. <laughs> Second class is when the post office stamps your package until it becomes a letter. <laughs> and third class is when they hand your package to a blindfolded wino and spin them around and push him out the door. <laughs> now, don't think for a moment that I'm bashing people in the post office. They are well-intentioned, good people who mean well, and in the great majority of cases are doing the best they can do given the context of the system in which they work. You and I, for the most part, would behave no differently if we were creatures of that same system. It's a, if it doesn't work, it's a systemic problem, not a people problem, because those very same people put to work in a private, competitive, enterprise system would probably behave much differently. But nonetheless, it does give us a glimpse of what health care might look like if the government were to come to, to run it. A very notable, popular national radio host recently, when I turned it on, had a uh, little contest. He asked people to call up that day and he said, please give me a list, tell me, the li a list of things that government does well. And it was really interesting to hear. You have to think about that, by the way. Sit down sometime with a piece of paper and pencil and try to make a list of the things that you're confident government does well and see how many you can come up with. Again, I'm not bashing people in government. I'm simply observing a phenomenon that is peculiar to the nature of the system. Whereas the marketplace, what if I asked you to, to make a list of things that the marketplace does well? How long would we be here? They make pretty good pictures, they make good tablecloths, tables, screens, projectors, they make cars, they make televisions, refrigerators. It's an endless list, isn't it? And by and large, anything the market tends to produce that doesn't satisfy the consumer is not long for this world, is it? Doesn't, doesn't fester as a chronic problem, something that costs money that people keep making even though nobody wants it, tends to go away because there's a natural built-in incentive for the market to, to uh, uh, meet consumer needs. Well, enough said about uh, 
uh, the government raising those questions. Let's just say a few words about the market and then we'll move on towards what some solutions might be, uh, what causes of the problem might be and then some solutions to it. What about the market? Why does it tend to be uh, a mechanism that uh, produces the greatest good for the greatest number? The kind of mechanism that I think we ought to maximize its employment, the use of it in area after area. One is it, it, it's the, er, the arena of free and willing exchange. Free and willing exchange, nothing coerced. And as a result of that, you tend to get what you want and you want what you get. And you tend to get what you pay for. I think that's true even in a socialized system, by the way. People say in Canada, well, health care is free. In fact, I visited Russia several times and they used to tell me, the tour guides, how wonderful it was that if any of us got sick, we could get free health care. And I heard about Russian health care. And I thought, well, it's proof again. You get what you pay for. I think that's true even in socialized arrangements. Well, uh, furthermore, in the marketplace or when the marketplace governs, there is competition which tends to evaporate the more you have government in charge. Competition, I think we all understand that's a healthy thing. Supply and demand regulate prices instead of po political edict. So we don't have long lines, we don't have goods that aren't there. Supply and demand regulate prices. And furthermore, our life is depoliticized. Activities are depoliticized. Milton Friedman has uh, put it this way. He said, can you imagine if automobiles were a government commodity produced by a government monopoly, what would, what would that engender? Well, you'd probably have, uh, after all, car production would have to compete with everything else in the federal budget, right? It would only be allocated so much and it would have to compete for farm subsidies and foreign aid and all sorts of other things the government does. A private car firm doesn't have to think about those things, it makes cars. But if it's part of the government budget, it has to compete for all these other things that politicians want to spend money on. All right, and if that's the case, uh, it may be shortchanged at any given time. Well, um, well, back to the car example. Friedman says if, if government made cars, you'd probably have a bureaucracy that said, well, uh, we're not going to waste a lot of money giving consumers the choice of any color that they want and, and, and 500 different kinds of automobiles. We're going to standardize this as government likes to do. We're going to have half a dozen models and three or four colors and that's what you get to pick. And we would have endless harangues about this. You'd, you know, people who wanted red cars instead of green ones that were offered this year would be picketing and there would be conflict and strife. Every time you take matters and put them into the political arena, faction preys upon faction, political power and special interests take over, and the end result is a lot of people don't get what they really want. Whereas in the marketplace, you can shop around, there's competition, you tend to get what you want. Seems to me that any rearrangement of the healthcare system ought to try to take advantage to the greatest extent possible of these virtues of the marketplace and not try to diminish them. And speaking of politicization, by the way, you folks ought to understand this better than anybody. How many people, and answer honestly, how many of you teachers believe that it has been a blessing for you to be overseen and supervised and budgeted by politicians? <laughs> how many of you enjoy dealing with them? How many of you feel that that's the most effective way to deliver the service that we're, that we're all about here? Okay, so think twice before you want the same folks to be running your health care. Well, um, okay, but you might say, well, but, but hasn't the market been in charge? If we have a problem and a crisis, can't we blame it on the market? I mean, you hear that all the time. You have folks in Washington telling us that we must have much more government in health care because we've had too much of the market and it's caused the problem. The problem has been the absence of government, they tell us, in health care. And therefore, the solution is more government in one form or another. Well, let me discuss for you three or four ways in which, and not the only ways, but perhaps the only ones I have time for here, the major ways in which government has been involved in the marketplace and has contributed to the problem. First way is its reimbursement policies, which have essentially been, for many, many years, cost plus. 
cost plus reimbursement, especially prior to 1983. What do I mean by this? You know, and keep in mind, the, the government's reimbursement policies, how it pays for the health care it buys through its programs, it, it is going to have a major impact on the marketplace. Because it's got all these resources, it can deficit spend if it has to, and, and it can buy up these health care resources, leaving the rest of us to have to bid higher prices to get what's left. What it does, because it's such a huge chunk, nearly half of all that we spend on health care, what it does has a profound impact on the cost and prices of, of health care for all of us. Well, prior to 1983, the government's policy and, and through its Medicaid, Medicare programs, was essentially cost plus, which just said, hey, just tell us what your costs are and send us, add on a little bit and send us the bill. Isn't that an incentive to do what? To raise costs, find, find ways to pad your costs because it, there's this, this outfit out here that just says, that, just send us the bill, we'll, we'll, we'll write the check. Cost plus reimbursement. By itself would have contributed to health care price inflation well above, I'm sure, the general price inflation. In 1983, that policy began to change, by the way, but I don't think it did so for the better. After having contributed mightily to the increase in health care costs with cost plus reimbursement policies, in 1983, the government started to change. It said, hey, we got too many other things in our budget we have to spend money for and worry about. We, ha we have to get these health care costs under control. How did they do it? Through new regulations. First, the, uh, what is known as the DRGs in Medicare, Diagnostic Related Groups, where they try to come up with this kind of like cookbook medicine, saying, you know, well, this is what we will pay, here's what uh, a gallbladder operation is worth, uh, various mechanisms that also require, price control mechanisms that also required vast new expansions of paperwork. Uh, utilization review committees and all sorts of, uh, uh, of time-consuming and expensive mechanisms upon hospitals and health care providers. This was succeeded in the, uh, uh, later in the 80s by RBRVS, Resource-Based Relative Value Scale, a kind of comparable worth scheme for doctors. The Heritage Foundation has described this scheme, this regulatory scheme, which came about, I think, in 86 or 87, as the most uh, dramatic expansion of health care regulations in the history of this country. Massive new costly regulations, all designed to try to deal with the earlier problem that largely government's own reimbursement policies created. These things have been a factor. We've already had lots of regulations in health care. We cannot claim that the market has been in charge, that we've had an absence of government, and therefore the solu only solution is more government. A second intervention by government that has skewed the health care marketplace relates to tax policy. And this really has its origins in the Second World War, when we had price, uh, price and wage controls on many things. And many employers facing controls on wages, how much they could offer, and yet competing in the labor market had to try to attract workers. They decided, well, if we can't pay more in wages because of the controls, we'll throw in health care benefits as a way of competing in the marketplace. So health care benefits employer provided became it was something we sort of take for granted today. They're so commonplace. They weren't before the 1940s. Before then, typically, almost everybody took care of their own health care needs. They didn't, it wasn't something that the employer provided, but partly, uh, largely as a result of uh, wartime wage controls, employer provided health insurance emerged. And shortly thereafter, the IRS rendered a ruling that said that employers could count health care expenses for their employees as a deductible expense. In other words, employers, when they pay a dollar for health care on behalf of you, they get a dollar's worth of health care. But that same tax advantage was not passed on to you. In other words, you as an individual, when you go out into the marketplace and buy health care, whether it be health insurance or actual health care, you're spending not pre-tax dollars, you're spending post-tax dollars, right? Dollars on which you've already paid taxes. When you add state and federal and, and local taxation, the average American's paying about 43 cents of every dollar he earns in taxes. What, th what that means with regard to health care is that uh, if you've earned a dollar, 
you can spend 43 cents of it. All right, now when an employer buys health care because it's deductible, he, he gets a dollar's worth of health care for a dollar that he spends. For you, you've got to do it with post-tax dollars. What kind of incentive arrangement does that set up? Everybody wants to look for a way to have their health care paid for with somebody else, with pre-tax dollars. That was a vast encouragement to employer-provided health care. All right. Well, that's going to have a, a, a pros and cons, but one of the dramatic uh, downsides of this is it distances the user of health care from the cost of health care. It establishes this principle of third-party payment. It means that you as a user of health care may not ever really know exactly what this stuff is costing that you're asking for more of. And when that's the case, you tend to want more of it. And by the way, you know, it's, it's very expensive to have third parties handle, especially the smaller medical bills. You know, I mentioned to you yesterday, yesterday that in Michigan we've had uh, zero deductibles for state employees. Well, and for every $25 bottle of pills, it probably costs $50 in administrative expense. Wouldn't it be better if we had a system that, in which it, you were empowered to pay at least the smaller medical bills out of your pocket, rather than some third party? I just want to plant a seed because I'm going to suggest to you in a moment how we might do that. But tax policy has shifted us in the direction of third party payer, sometimes first dollar, and certainly low deductible policies health insurance policies because that's what makes sense economically. You get socked if you pay for it in post-tax dollars, but you get, uh, uh, not subsidized because it's your, your money, but you, at least it's favorably treated if it's purchased with pre-tax dollars. Well, um, a third way in which government has interfered and, and helped to cause this problem we're talking about is uh, its regulations. I mentioned this earlier and said I'd come back to it. I want to give you several examples. One I've kind of given you already, the DRGs, the RBRVS, these costly uh, uh, paperwork burdens that every doctor can go on and on about and tell you how they're, they're really uh, raising his costs with, that he has to then pass on to you. But there are other ways, other regulations. How many of you are aware of certificates of need? This is a state regulation. So, and you, I'm sure you have them in Texas. I shouldn't say that, but there, some states now are moving away from them, so maybe you're one that's done away with them. But most states have certificate of need regulations, which says that before a hospital or even a nursing home can expand its facilities, add beds, add a new machine or whatever, it must receive approval from some state-appointed board. Now the intention here was, well, hey, we've got these costs going out of control, we, and so the way to do that is to, is to make these uh, institutions uh, get approval before they can add to costs, which is another way of saying adding to supply. Okay, to, since when does adding to the supply of something raise its cost? That usually is a way of helping to control cost. Now there have been many studies done, including one from Northwestern University that was, has been quite revealing, indicating that the, the verdict of certificates of need is not a good one. In fact, they have actually contributed to rising health care costs. They've not controlled them for at least a couple reasons. One is they stifle competition between health care providers. They stifle competition. And secondly, by denying sometimes capital acquisitions, they deny the economies of scale and the efficiencies that can come about through such purchases. Now, many economists far more qualified than I am in this area have begun to document this and it's a major reason why states are beginning to withdraw from these regulations. But for years they've been a major factor in raising health care costs. Uh, another example would be state mandated health benefits. Boy, you're going to love this. Every state now has these. These are required coverages that state governments have said health insurers must include in their policies. If you're a health insurer, you want to sell policies in this state, you have to include coverages for the following things, whatever state governments have decided to include. You know, by the way, in 1970, there were only 30 of these state mandates across the 50 states. Some states, therefore, didn't even have any. It was a freedom of choice in the health insurance marketplace. Only 30. How many are there today? Over 1,000. 
thousand. State mandated health benefits, the list is long and getting longer. Some of them sound more reasonable than others. In Michigan, we require coverage, which you as a health insurance purchaser must pay for, for mammograms and for alcohol and drug abuse treatment. What's that mean, by the way? That means, you know, in my case, I'll make it very personal. I have no intention of ever becoming addicted to drugs, ever using them. I'm a healthcare nut. You know, I have no, I don't want to pay for insurance to cover me for those things. I have confidence in my ability to avoid those problems. Doesn't matter. I got to buy them anyway. Uh, the services of chiropractors and podiatrists and consulting psychologists are commonly mandated now. They are in my state. Um, and by the way, who lobbies for these things? <laughs> Do you think consumers go to the Capitol and say, please, make me buy these things? No, these, are, these particular special interests who go to the legislature and they say, hey, you know, maybe they just say this among themselves, but they say we could get people to buy more of our services if we, if we get the government to pass a law that says they have to buy them. I'll give you some, some really weird examples here, by the way. Uh, in Minnesota, they require coverage for hair transplants. In Minnesota. In, it's cold there, right? <laughs> in, <laughs> in California. California requires coverage for marriage counseling as a state-mandated health benefit. In Vermont, and I don't know why somebody hasn't raised the constitutional, uh, uh, the constitutional question about this, they require pastoral counseling. Pastoral counseling. Massachusetts requires coverage for deposits to a sperm bank. So, you may never uh, oh, and by the way, in vitro fertilization is, re is required coverage in five states, acupuncture in four states, the services of natural paths, these are people who treat ailments uh, with, with herbs, are required in two or three states. Now, I don't want to render a value judgment as to these particular services. You know, maybe these are good things. What I'm raising is a question that has to do with freedom of choice in the health insurance marketplace. Why can't I purchase a health insurance policy that's tailored to my needs rather than somebody else's? And don't forget, every single one of these char uh, uh, mandates has a cost attached to it. And at NCPA, the National Center for Policy Analysis in Dallas, Texas, they have done extensive studies and have determined that at a minimum, 20% of the nation's 37 million uninsured don't have insurance simply because the cost of state mandated benefits have priced them out of the insurance market. It's like saying, mandating all these coverages would be like saying, okay, everybody, if you want to buy a car, it has to be a Cadillac. What would be the result? Some people would have Cadillacs, a lot of folks wouldn't have any car at all. And of course, freedom of choice is out the window. Just this one tiny area, it's not even federal, it's just state, accounts for perhaps 20% or more of the uninsured. At any given time in the hopper, in, in our legislature, and I think this is true in every state, somebody, some legislator, has got more mandates they want to heap on health care consumers. This particularly disadvantages small business, by the way, as you might imagine. Uh, there is one way in which larger companies can escape many of these mandates by self-insuring. But that even further disadvantages small businesses, which create 75, 80 percent of our new jobs. It disadvantages individuals who can't obviously self-insure and have to go out and buy policies out of their own pocket. Well, another way in which, uh, oh, in fact, no, I need to, I want to move on to uh, some other things I'm going to stop that at, at that point, you might be asking yourself, well, what about the uninsured? We keep hearing about that. Isn't that a crisis? I've given you one reason why they're uninsured, 20% or more of them, but this is a question that deserves a little bit more discussion. I want to tell you something about who the 37 million uninsured are. Who are they? Is this a national crisis that requires government intervention? Half of all the uninsured lack insurance for four months or less, typically because they are in, in between jobs. Half of all of the uninsured lack insurance for four months or less. This isn't some massive chronic problem year after year for most people. Only 15% are uninsured for more than 15 months. 
Only 15% are uninsured for more than 15 months. I can give you some other statistics. I'll go through this fairly quickly. 60% are young people under 30 for whom at today's costs, health care doesn't seem like it's a very good deal. They have their health and they've consciously decided, uh, and many of them, that uh, although they may have the resources, they're young, they don't need it yet. That may be an unwise choice, but it is for many, nonetheless, a choice. 46% of uninsured households have incomes above 20,000. 17% have incomes above 40,000. So for some of the uninsured, this isn't a poverty problem. Okay. I think there's a lot that we can do, by the way, to, to bring the cost of health insurance down. There's an awful lot we've done to make it more expensive. I've given you some examples. Anything that raises the cost of health insurance, whether it be state mandated benefits or something else in the health care field, will we'll tend to, to uh, price some people out of the health insurance marketplace. There's much that we can do there. I think, if anything, this uninsured problem has been vastly overblown, and it's not been regarded for what it really is. It's an affordability problem for some people. It isn't uh, a, an unavailability problem. Well, what are some principles, then, that should govern health care reform? I'm moving us towards some brief description of what real solutions might involve. What are the uh, principles that we should govern, or we should use to govern health care reform? One is, I think we should make sure that we maximize competition. Let's not lose that in, along the wayside as we talk about what we want to do in health care. Let's, let's remember competition is important. Let's find ways to maximize it. Let's find ways to inform consumers. And some of the reform ideas I'll give you in a moment would help us do that. Let's inform consumers so they raise the right questions so that they can shop around in the medical marketplace. Let's find ways to encourage the user of health care to be the payer of health care. Tighten that connection. Reduce the reliance upon third-party arrangements, in other words. There are proposals that can help us do that. Encourage the user to be the payer. Again, recognizing Friedman's principle that nobody spends somebody else's money as carefully as he spends his own. So if we can tighten that connection up between user and payer, we will help to some degree to solve the problem. Fourth point we need to remember as we fashion a health care plan is the economizer must benefit from the economizing. It's on this principle alone that I fear that the Clinton health care plan is likely to fail if it's adopted. The economizer must benefit from the economizing. In other words, what if the government said to you that you could buy a Cadillac or a Chevy, but if you chose a Chevy, you'd have to give the savings to the government? Which are you going to take? Take the Cadillac every time. If you don't benefit from the savings, then what's that say about what you're going to ask for? You'll want it all, right? The economizer must benefit from the economizing. There must be something in it for you if you're going to choose to do with less, if you even have the choice to shop around and perhaps do with less. I think, furthermore, another principle ought to be to avoid damaging tax increases. That's, that's really redundant. Uh, <laughs> avoid tax increases. Uh, because we have to remember that tax increases destroy our economic base. They hit small businesses, the generator of the lion's share of new jobs. Tax increases isn't something that the American economy will benefit from. If anything, we are overgoverned and overtaxed. I fear the costs of a national health care plan and what it will do to the state of the economy. Do we really advance health care reform if we throw people out of work? If we prevent the creation of new businesses and self-reliant people? I don't think so, and that's what tax hikes will do, and do more of it, the bigger they are. And I think, furthermore, we ought to find ways to improve access and control runaway costs. Okay, and do it in a way that doesn't sacrifice quality or your choice. Well, what are some of the proposals that are coming forth from uh, the administration and others in Washington that, personally, I don't like? And then I'll give you some that I do. I'm going to run through these very quickly. One is uh, there are price controls being talked about as part of some plan, price controls. We have 40 centuries of price controls to tell us that they never work. They lead to rationing, shortages of supplies, people leaving that occupation, black markets. I don't think we want that. Another idea is global budgeting. 
the Clinton administration is talking favorably about this, where they say, well, we're just going to add up all health care spending, put a ceiling on it, and say that's the most America can spend on health care, which is another way of imposing, ultimately, rationing and price control. Uh, they're also coming out with this notion of one size fits all. They're talking about a plan in which the government will stipulate the health care benefits for every American. One size fits all. In fact, there was a story in the Detroit News again a couple weeks ago, headlined, Nobody Opts Out of Clinton Program. And they're talking about they've already made the decision that uh, whatever package of benefits the government devises for you in this national plan, they're not going to give people the option of, of bowing out of it. Companies will not be able to give you a cafeteria plan and multiple benefits. They will not be able to vary wages with benefits. In other words, one, one size fits all. Should that surprise us, by the way, when the 500 plus member of Hillary's task, task force is almost all government employees? The number of private sector people in that task force varies between two and four. Really, the rest are government employees. Should it be surprising that they're coming up with new government schemes, government programs? Uh, managed competition, it's another uh, concept. It's likely to be the pillar of the, of the Clinton health care plan. Managed competition means they're going to take maybe a state at a time or perhaps by region and they're going to say that we're going to have a national federal health board of some sort or regional boards and in these various regions they will make sure that private that private insurers come to them before they can offer insurance to you that they meet all these government stipulations for this one-size-fits-all package and that somehow that's going to control health care costs but by limiting your choices and putting government in charge of what you get and what you don't um, Ken Abram Abramowitz, one of the advisors to the uh, Hillary task force, has said this. Here's, here's this condescending government knows all attitude that too often has been coming forth from Washington. He says, quote, right now health care is purchased by 250 million morons called U.S. citizens. Managed competition would move them out, reduce their influence, and let smart professionals buy it on their behalf. I couldn't have said that in a more damaging way if I had written it to describe their thinking. But this is Ken Abramowitz, reported in the New York Times, uh, who's been advising the uh, Hillary Task Force. That's the thinking behind managed competition. You dummies out there don't know how to take care of yourself, and, and we're going to have to do it for you. Well, and then, of course, there are those who say we need a Canadian free system. Isn't that great? They're all coming over here for health care. And Great Britain's socialized system. There's much I could say about both, but I'll refer you to that 20 myths about national health insurance. It'll tell you everything, including how long are the waiting lines before you can even get your gallbladder out. How many people die before they, thousands, before they can even get a simple operation in countries like that. Finally, what are the market-based solutions to this problem? But leading up to this, and here I am with hardly any time left to talk about it. Ten minutes, great, thank you. Let me give you some ideas here along uh, the lines of uh, market-based solutions, at least solutions that don't involve more government, bureaucracy, regulations, controls, and the kind of stuff that got us into this mess in the first place. What are they? Well, one is uh, a promising concept called MetaSave accounts. And there is some government involved in this, but it's nothing like these other notions. In fact, it would lead to a withdrawal of government, but uh, still some involvement. MetaSave accounts, sometimes they're call, called uh, medical IRAs. Medical IRAs, patterned after the individual retirement accounts. How would these work? Well, right now, the average employer in America is paying for the average employee, on average, $4,500 in health care costs for that person and his family. $4,500. Under the MetaSave concept, employers could take, say, $3,000 of that. I mean, the numbers are, you know, whatever you want to pick. They could take $3,000 of that, deposit it into this MetaSave account, which would be under your control, like, medical, like IRAs are, invested as you choose, and you would then use that, those funds to pay the smaller medical bills under $3,000 a year, which means that the other $1,500 that employers are paying, currently up to $4,500 on average, they could use to simply buy catastrophic health insurance that would cover the expenses above $3,000. The vast majority of Americans' health care needs in any given year could be handled by uh, the MetaSave account monies. 
Okay, you, and you would be in charge of them. You would be empowered. You would withdraw from that fund. And by the way, it would be portable. You could take it with you. So in between jobs, you're not without uh, capability of purchasing insurance to tide you over. That would help solve part of the uninsured problem. The point is, you would be empowered to spend your money. Okay, reduce that third party payment influence. Now, maybe it's even clear, more clearly seen if you're self-employed. It means you as an individual could put aside, and, and, and this would be tax-free, incidentally, uh, and the benefits in it, uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, as it grows, it would be, grow tax-free. You, you could put that aside for medical expenses so that you could handle those smaller medical bills. That would allow you then to buy health insurance that had very high deductibles. And everybody knows that that's a surefire way to bring down premiums. Today, the average deductible is about $250. If you could raise that to $3,000, $4,000, because you've got a MetaSave account that allows you the wherewithal to take care of your smaller medical bills yourself, you could enjoy enormous savings on the, the catastrophic health insurance that you buy. And you can do that without a bureaucracy, no new department of MetaSave accounts required. You know, it's a bookkeeping entry, essentially. And there's a debate among the free market community about this, those who favor it, as to uh, should we allow people to use those MetaSave account monies for things other than medical care? I'm one of those who would argue, yes, maximum freedom. Let people, if, if it, near the end of the year they, they decide, wow, I had good health, I didn't have to spend as much uh, this year as I have put into that account, I can take it out this year's MetaSave monies and spend it for something else. I'd let people have that choice. The economizer could benefit from the economizing, which would cause people to think, well, do I really need that other bottle of pills? Do I need this extra run to see the doctor? Okay. That in itself would do a lot, I think, to restrain health care expenses and would, would assist literally tens of millions of Americans in taking care of this problem. What's another market-oriented reform that we ought to be pursuing? Roll back those state-mandated benefits. Why on earth are we talking about a massive expansion of government and health care when we know, obviously, that if we rolled back many of the existing encroachments, we could help solve this problem? Instead, what they're talking about in Washington is literally uh, superimposing upon all this costly stuff, all these existing regulations, a new body of government and government regulations. I'd say let's deal with the problem as we've created it to date, and part of that means rolling back these state-mandated health benefits. Allow insurers to offer no-frills, basic policies if that's what people want, or, or allow them if they want by free choice to load it up with these Christmas trees of benefits. Another aspect of uh, reform is, um, involves liability. My lawyer friend Bumper may disagree with me on this, I don't know. Uh, I think if we were to, to uh, there are a couple ways to handle this. One is to, you're all aware of the problem of enormous damage awards that end up being factored into the costs of health care. Uh, that's largely due to the costs of what is known as non-economic damages, pain and suffering. I don't think anybody would argue that government should limit what someone is entitled to in the way of economic damages, of actual costs that they had to incur because of someone's negligence, such as lost wages, actual medical expenses, you know, they're entitled to that. But when you get into this area, nebulous area of pain and suffering, I believe it's not an expansion of government, but a limitation of government to put parameters around the law and say, you, no more blank checks, no more arbitrary, out of the, out of the air, one dollar, one billion dollar settlements. I mean, we've got, we're going to put some parameters to the law in this nebulous, difficult to define pain and suffering thing, okay, which might mean putting caps on it at some arbitrary level. Another way, and maybe a more fundamental way, is to reintroduce and enforce exculpatory clauses, which we've largely done away with, I believe, where I could go in to uh, uh, and contract maybe with a hospital, with an insurer, and say, in advance, I, I promise that the most I will ever sue for if something is, some harm is done to me, is actual monetary damages and some ceiling amount of pain and suffering. I mean, how on earth can insurers insure for something if there's this vast area that they have no way of knowing in advance what it could end up being? One dollar, billion dollars, who knows? These are totally arbitrary and, and extremely costly. Liability reform is needed. 
Uh, Medicaid vouchers. It's not, it's not the end of the road, but it's a solution, partial solution that might assist us in with getting government out of this field. It's kind of like a privatization of Medicaid. For those who are of, of low income, at least for the time being, until we can fashion a truly market solution to these people and transit from here to that market solution, private charitable organizations, what have you, why not have Medicaid vouchers in which instead of paying the costs of medical care for the poor, uh, they simply are given a voucher which they can use to shop around and in the private marketplace buy private health insurance. It's a more cost-effective way of doing it than we now do it with government and its Medicaid program, although I don't think it's ultimately the final answer. I would like to see government out of medicine altogether and uh, the creation of, uh, of more private charitable activity to care for those uh, who, who need some assistance. And uh, uh, well, I'm going to leave it at that so I can give you time for questions because I'm already over. Those are just some, but not all, of the uh, uh, solutions that might help us resolve this, this health care problem. If nothing else, I hope what I've done is to plant some questions in your mind that you might ask your legislators as we engage this national debate. Ben, thank you very much, Ben. How significant is the uh, the control over that the I, I believe it's the AMA uh, over the supply of doctors and the licensing and all that? I, I've always had the uh, the opinion that uh, not as many doctors exist as would exist, and there mm -hmm. there isn't the grade of doctors. Can you uh, comment on that, please? Yes, I'm glad you brought that up. In fact, remember when I kind of rushed through that list of the ways in which government's involved? That was the one I skipped. But I'm glad you brought it up occupational licensure which the American Medical Association, of course, has championed for years. And if they had their way, they'd tighten that up even further. Uh, uh, Friedman and other economists have shown time and time again that occupational licensure has the effect, if not the actual original intent, of restricting the supply of people in a profession and therefore raising the cost of those who are lucky to get there. Uh, and that happens in a number of ways. There, there are healthcare practitioners in doctor's offices or in hospitals who could do more than they're presently allowed or licensed to do. Uh, but by, by licensing, uh, they're restricted from engaging in that activity. The end result of that is to raise costs. The AMA is, is very much a kind of doctor's labor union. It functions that way. It restricts the supply of physicians and therefore raises the price. And, and by the way, where do they get their power? I would argue very strongly that the AMA isn't entirely, or at least it doesn't derive its influence entirely from the marketplace. It derives it from its influence over primarily state legislatures. Uh, it, it has a very cozy relationship with most legislatures and has uh, been in the forefront of devising laws, regulations, uh, licensing restrictions, uh, medical school entry requirements uh, that have the effect of limiting those who can get into the profession or can practice. Uh, but they, they largely derive their power from what they've been able to convince state governments to do on their behalf. Yes? What's the likelihood that any of these free market approaches to the problem will ever get to the table? Or is this simply going to be something that's going to be cooked up and delivered by Hillary Clinton and, her, and, and Democratic Congress? I thought maybe three, four months ago that it was going to be really tough sledding, that it, you know, back in like February or March and when the administration was riding high and they certainly had their, uh, the Democratic Party in charge of both houses, it, it looked like, wow, how are we going to overcome this when there's so much education that needs to be done? I'm a lot more optimistic now. Uh, I have seen a number of announcements along the way in the last few months of where uh, they are backtracking. I think they're understanding that, that they may have tougher sledding getting this full-blown socialized arrangement that they were first aiming for. So I'm encouraged by that. I'm also encouraged by the fact that more than 150, I think it's approaching 200 members of Congress now, have uh, co-sponsored the MetaSave concept. So there, there's growing awareness of that in, in Congress. Um, you know, what ultimately happens is going to depend largely upon how well informed the American people are and, and are they going to be raising and asking these questions. 
the ones that list I gave you about that we should ask about government, you ought to be asking your representatives every time they come home and, and talk uh, to their constituents, you should be asking them these questions. You should be asking them, what are you doing about liability reform? What are you doing about Medisave accounts? And why should we trust government to do all these things in healthcare when they haven't gotten their, their act together in every other area, practically? So I'm hopeful, but it's, it's going to be a tough educational battle. You know, maybe the thing more than anything else that will uh, help us in this debate is going to be that whatever Hillary comes up with is likely to have an, an enormous price tag. And, and maybe that will prompt people to start looking for alternatives. I hope so. One more? The federal okay. government has been running the Veterans Administration health program for a long time. The federal government has been running the Veterans Administration health program for a long time. Yeah. Uh, what are the results of that? Is what does that forebode or foretell for a government, major government expansion? Oh, very good question. What about the Veterans uh, Administration, Veterans Hospitals? I mean, there's a case where government's been in charge. Do you know of veterans who are delighted with the Veterans uh, Hospitals? They make movies about how bad they are. One well, right here. Okay, you may have had a very good experience. You may have had a very good experience, but I don't know that that's the rule. So I, I'm not a, an authority on the veterans' hospitals, but I get the very strong impression that there's lots of room for improvement, that it's not a model that we should ba base the uh, national health care uh, system upon. I, I guess I've run way over, and he told me I could only take that one last one. Um, how about if, if you can ask him after the session, you're not running, are you running right off? Or? Uh, no, Thanks I'll be here uh, until about 1.30. Hey, Jim. Thank you for being so attentive on a subject that can be often technical. Thank you. Thank you.